one of the things that I spotted kind of early on was the idea that the Holy Spirit would be very much present during that time people refer to as the tribulation. And a lot of people teach that the Holy Spirit will be present on the earth during that time because the Spirit is omnipresent, of course. But the Spirit is actually going to be given to new believers during that time. Is there a passage that talks about that? Oh yeah, there is. It's in Revelation chapter 5. We're going to be looking at that in this video. If we look really close, really closely, and we compare scripture with scripture, we're going to see some really amazing things, particularly concerning the Holy Spirit. Revelation 5 verse 6, And between the throne and the four living creatures, and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. We know that Revelation is communicating a story symbolically through a series of visions. So Christ is not really a lamb. Uh, figuratively speaking, he is because he is that sacrifice for our sins. He doesn't have seven horns. He doesn't have seven eyes. So we need to break all this down into its symbolic meaning. And the way that we do that is we're going to compare scripture with scripture. We're going to go back into the Old Testament and we're going to see where the Bible talks about horns and where the Bible talks about seven eyes referring to the Holy Spirit. And believe it or not, it does. Let's take a look at the horns first. A horn in the Old Testament symbolized uh, strength, sometimes victory, power. And let's take a look at Psalm 92 verses 9 through 11. For behold your enemies, O Lord, for behold your enemies shall perish. All evildoers shall be scattered, but you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. You have poured over me fresh oil. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies, and my ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. The psalmist is saying that, that his horn, that his power, is stronger than that of a wild ox and he's had fresh oil poured over him that is he's had fresh anointing on him so here we kind of see a connection between the power and the anointing which has to do with the oil and of course if you have that anointing and you have the power you will see your enemies fall the Lamb also has seven eyes, and these two represent the Holy Spirit. They're the seven spirits of God, and they're sent out into all the earth. Now, we saw the seven spirits in Revelation chapter 1 in the greeting, you know, from the seven spirits before the throne. We saw the seven spirits in Revelation chapter 4 as those seven torches or flames of fire before the throne of God. And here again, we see the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. There aren't seven Holy Spirits. There's only one, but seven is the number of divinity. So what we are led to understand here is that the fullness of the divine nature rests in Christ and in the Spirit of God. They're all God. What Old Testament passage talks about seven eyes representing the Holy Spirit? Well, that's found actually in Zechariah chapter 3, and we'll read verses 8 through 10. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. Okay, and that's um, sort of code for Christ. Christ is the branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. This passage is also very symbolic. Um, Zechariah is a book that's written, again, in using symbolism, a lot of symbolism. And Joshua, the high priest here, was one of the exiles in Babylon who returned 
to uh, Jerusalem and Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel, who was a civil leader, together rebuilt the temple. We read about olive trees and lampstands in Zechariah 4, which is the same symbolism that's used about the two witnesses, who I believe are also going to be erecting a temple. So they have this in common, two, uh, Joshua and Zerubbabel and Elijah and Moses, both erecting temples. But let's just take a look at this seven eye thing. The stone uh, here that has the seven eyes, and by the way, that word eyes can mean facets, okay? So there could be seven facets on the stone, but that's layered over the idea of, of eyes, seven eyes, which have to do with kind of omniscience. The stone, who is the lamb, who is also the branch, in this passage in Zechariah, has the power and the authority to remove iniquity in a single day. Christ is going to remove the iniquity of Israel in a single day. And so let's just take a look at that day, and then we'll hop on over to some passages that talk about um, what the Spirit is going to be doing. That single day when the iniquity of Israel is removed is going to be when Christ returns as the conquering king. Zechariah 12, 10, and Zechariah 13, 1. We're just going to read those couple of verses there. And this has to do with when Christ returns. Then I will pour out on the house of David and on the people of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and prayer. And they will look on me, the one they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. And on that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the people of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. So the day that their iniquity will be forgiven is the day that they see the Lord. And this passage in Zechariah is also quoted in Revelation chapter 1. The seven eyes or the seven facets on the stone or the seven eyes on the lamb also represent this spirit of grace that's going to be poured out on the house of David at Christ's return. The spirit is also connected with the erection of a temple. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord which range through the whole earth. So again, we're talking about seven eyes that have this kind of omniscience. They can see the whole earth. And we're also talking about the rebuilding of a temple. So we have the spirit there, the spirit's empowerment. We have the seven eyes, okay, the seven facets on the stone. So you can see there's this tremendous amount of layering of Old Testament illusions and symbolism. And for some people, and even for myself sometimes, there is there are so many layers, it's hard to keep them all like in my mind at the same time to be able to connect them all. There, It is a bit of work sometimes, you know, pulling these things out and then just actually holding on to them so we can see all the connections here. And remember, prophecy is pattern and prophecy is connection, where we're connecting these various passages of scripture together to come up with um, a narrative of some kind. So Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest represent a pattern for two future lampstands and olive trees which are actually described in Zechariah chapter 4. And both sets of olive trees will participate in the erection of the temple that they're in charge of. So Zerubbabel and Joshua were responsible for encouraging people and overseeing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Zechariah 4 says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, declares the Lord. And that, that temple would be erected. And they had some trials and, and tribulations while they were in the process of building that temple. And then Elijah and Moses are also going to be spirit-filled, end-time olive trees who are also going to be rebuilding or erecting the Tabernacle of David, another temple with the Ark of the Covenant. And the seven eyes represent the spirit who is going to be present on earth to empower the witnesses to do that. 
but there's more. <laughs> there is much more when it comes to talking about the seven eyes and the seven horns, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. The passage tells us that before the Lamb takes the scroll, the Spirit will have already been sent out into all the earth. That is, there is going to be another Pentecost event, okay? Only it's not at Pentecost, it's at that third first fruits harvest, which is the one in the fall. That doesn't last just one day, it lasts seven days. And this, the Holy Spirit will have already been sent out before Christ takes the scroll. Uh, let's read the passage again. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. So the lamb is one of the elders. Okay, he is one of them. We are all brothers together. Christ is our elder brother, the firstborn, and we are his associates. I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Okay, and this is a picture of Christ's death and resurrection, with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. The Holy Spirit is coming back. And that's what the Feast of Tabernacles is all about. It's one of the things it's about. Actually, there's many layers of fulfillment to all of the, the feasts of the Lord. But the Spirit is going to be sent out again. The 144,000 are going to be sealed in the Holy Spirit. They're going to get a double portion, just the way the 12 apostles did. The apostles got their first portion of the Holy Spirit on first fruits the day Jesus rose from the dead. They got their double portion, their second impartation of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost 50 days later along with 120 other people, along with 3,000 other people. The first impartation for the 144,000 is going to be from other believers who have been uh, made immortal. The second impartation is going to be like when the fire came down at Pentecost and everybody gets the Holy Spirit. Uh, Joel 2, 28 through 31. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before that great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So the Spirit of God is going to be poured out in this second Joel 2 outpouring before the events associated with the sixth seal. Okay, Before the sun goes dark, the moon turns to blood. Before the wrath of God is poured out. The pattern for us passing the baton to this next group of people is like Elijah and Elisha, where Elijah told Elisha that if you see me go, then you will receive what you've asked. And remember, what did Elisha want? He wanted a double portion of the spirit. Okay, the 144,000 will get a double portion of the spirit because they're going to see us go. They're going to see that first group go. And the same thing happened with the apostles. They got their first installment of the Holy Spirit on first fruits when Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then on the Mount of Olives, 10 days before Pentecost, they saw Jesus go. Jesus deliberately took them to a place where they could see him leave from the Mount of Olives, and remember, that's the place he's coming back to, they saw him go, and so they would receive a double portion, which is what they got 10 days later on Pentecost. This is a pattern. It's a pattern of Scripture, and those are the kinds of uh, repeating patterns that we're looking for that help us to understand uh, prophecy when it's being fulfilled. So the Spirit of God is going to be poured out before the day of the Lord begins in much the same way he was poured out on Pentecost in the first century. Once Christ accepts the scroll, once he receives that scroll, then that will be when he receives the commission for carrying out all the rest of the events that we see in the book of Revelation. 
what we call the judgments of the book of Revelation, the seal judgments and the bowl judgments and the trumpet judgments are not judgments. They're things that happen. They're events. Some of them will originate from God and some of them are when entities are given permission. The restraint is removed and they're given permission to act. We'll see that in Revelation 6, which is the next chapter that comes after chapter 5. But these are not judgments, okay? There aren't 21 judgments. There's only four, and they don't all happen during the what we would refer to as the tribulation time. So let's take a look at the elders now. We haven't really talked a lot about them, and there's really a lot that we could say about the elders and the fact that they are the new divine council that is um, seated in God's presence where angels had previously sat, and maybe there are angels on the periphery, but basically the new divine council is kings and priests, the 24 elders, you and me, who are the firstborn sons who are going to rule and reign along with Christ. So verse 8, And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Just to clear this up, the 24 elders are the ones who are holding the bowls of incense. They're the ones with the harps in their hands. We don't see the living creatures with harps in their hands. We don't see them holding bowls of incense. The four living creatures were already described in Revelation 4. No harps, <laughs> no bowls of incense. They don't wear a crown. They are not seated on thrones. They are not ones who are going to rule on earth. Whatever follows in this song that's going to be sung by the 24 elders. It is the song of the 24 elders and not of the living creatures. So the elders are depicted as worshipers by the harps that they hold. And I don't know if you realize this or not, but in the tabernacle of Moses, there wasn't really any worship going on like we think of it like in terms of songs and people singing and praising God. That, that wasn't there. That really didn't happen. That sort of was instituted with the Tabernacle of David when basically the inner Holy of Holies was separated out from the Tabernacle of Moses. And now that Holy of Holies, the Tabernacle of David, sat next to King David's palace. And it's in that place that David went and sang before the Lord and worshipped before the Lord and other people did as well. And this is the first real time that we see people singing and praising God as an act of worship in the temple or in this particular kind of temple. The elders are also falling down before the Lamb. Before they fell down before the throne of God and um, the Father in heaven, now they're falling down and worshiping the Lamb. The Lamb is God. Okay, the Lamb is God. Next, we see them with golden bowls of incense, and these are the prayers of the saints. Incense, the altar of incense, they're connected with prayers. And also, remember the fifth seal martyrs, they are their souls go under the altar of incense in heaven. So martyrdom, incense, and prayers, and smoke are all connected in scripture. So in Revelation 12, 10, we're given the same throne room scene. Okay, we, all the details aren't spelled out, but we know that there are people who are already present in heaven and their brethren, the martyrs, have showed up and they are all present in heaven. Let's just read this, Revelation 12, 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. So right now, Right this very minute, Satan is accusing believers before God, and Christ is 
standing in the gap for us. He's interceding for us. Hebrews tells us he ever lives to make intercession for the saints, that that is his job right now as our great high priest. So the elders are present in this throne room scene, just like we saw in Revelation 5. Revelation 12, the elders are there. They're the ones who've been witnessing and listening to the constant accusations that Satan is bringing against God's people. Not them, not the elders, but the people who are on earth. The fifth seal martyrs and others. And the elders are these intercessors for these people. And they are very relieved when Satan is finally cast out and all the noise that goes along with him has gone. And can you imagine that you, I mean, we're, we're going to experience this where we're in heaven. Satan has access to the throne room of God. He's going to be accusing all these people on earth, our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Um, there's fallen angels who are in heaven too. And there's this animosity between fallen angels and redeemed, immortal, glorified people. So this is not going to be extremely pleasant for us when we're in heaven. There's going to be a little bit of a trial that we have to put up with. And the Lord has been putting up with this for a long time. And so it's it'll be okay. We will only have to do it for a short while, like a, just a few months, and then Satan will be cast to the earth. Christ is our intercessor right now. But when he takes the scroll, he's going to leave the group of intercessors the elders. They're there. They're continuing to intercede. They continue to have the golden bowls of incense. But Christ gets up and he moves away from that group now. He's moving away from the altar of incense. He's taking a new commission. He is now being commissioned as the warrior king. Now, I hope you can see this, that Christ cannot take that scroll and abandon his station at the altar as an intercessor unless we're there. We're needed in heaven. So a lot of people think of the rapture as just being an escape. Well, you know, yeah, I suppose it's that. But actually, we're needed in heaven. We actually have a job to do. We're very necessary because that altar of incense cannot be abandoned. So we'll be brought there and we'll be interceding. Uh, for the saints on earth. And then Christ is free. He's free to leave and do all the things that are necessary for him to be our warrior king. Even though we are not Christ, we have delegated authority. God the Father has delegated authority to Christ, and Christ delegates authority to us. We have authority to intercede because it's delegated authority. It's being given to us to do this. We don't have it on our own. We don't have our own authority to do this. But when Christ says, I want you to fill in for me, I want you to pray for those people on earth, that's what we're going to be doing. So it may not be all of us all the time at the golden altar praying, but somebody will always be there. Uh, Revelation 5, 9, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. Remember in Revelation 4, we were introduced to this cry of the living creatures, the four living creatures who have the six wings and are full of eyes all around and within and day and night. They never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. So, they have their song, okay? They have what they say, what they sing, and it's holy, holy, holy. This is what they have always been saying. Remember in Isaiah chapter 6, same thing, holy, holy, holy. This is their song, okay? Now, when the 24 elders get there in heaven, you and me, we've got a different song, and it's a new song. It's one that's never been sung in heaven before because glorified saints have not been in heaven before. This is something brand new. And so it's a new song. It's something that the angels in heaven have never heard sung before. It's something probably we've never sung before. It's something that God, the Father, has never heard sung before except in his omniscience. And an observation I made a while back is that every raptured group has their own song. So the 24 elders are raptured. They have their song. 
the 144,000 of Israel. They're going to be raptured before the abomination, before the hour of trial that comes on the whole earth. And they have a song that nobody else can sing. And then the believers who are going to be caught up in that cloud rapture, the one that Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians 4, the one that's mentioned in Revelation 14.14, 14, we see these this group of people standing before the throne by the sea of glass, and they are singing a song. Their song is the song of Moses and the Lamb. It's the song of deliverance. So the 144,000. Here's what it says about their song. This is in Revelation 14. We'll start with verse 1. And then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And remember, uh, Revelation chapter 3, the letter to the church of Philadelphia, talks about names being written on that church's forehead. Okay? and the name of the Lamb, and the name of the city of our God, and so on and so forth. Verse 2 of Revelation 14, And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harp. And they were singing a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures, and before the elders. So they're a different group, okay? They're not the elder group. And the 144,000 arrive in heaven after the elder group. And the elder group that we read about, you know, the man-child being caught up to God and to his throne, who's going to rule and reign, okay, that the group that the child is associated with, that firstborn man-child, they're associated with the throne room. The 144,000 of Israel are associated with Mount Zion and with the temple, okay? And the elders will be present in heaven before the 144,000 arrive. And then it says that no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who'd been redeemed from the earth, okay? And that word redemption also hints at an eighth day when they will be caught up on an eighth day. So on that first day, they're going to uh, be transformed from mortal to immortal, and then on the eighth day, they will be redeemed, just like on the eighth day, a male child is redeemed. So the saints that are taken in that final cloud rapture, just before the sixth and the seventh seal, they'll sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Verse 2 of Revelation 15, And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. Okay, these are not spirits. They actually have hands. They've been um, caught up. They were people who were living during the reign of the beast. They had to resist taking the mark. They had to resist worshiping the image and um, res resist worshiping or being affiliated with the number of his name. These are the people standing by the sea of glass. And they are a raptured group. Okay, They are the group that Christ harvests in Revelation 14.14. 14. So this is that third group of raptured saints. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Okay, so let's go back to Revelation 5, and let's look at the song of the elders in greater detail. Verse 9, and they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. So they're singing the song about the worthiness of the Lamb and how he was able to take people and ransom them, pay the ransom so that they can be brought to God. We understand that Christ's worthiness to take the scroll is because he was willing to die. His worthiness didn't come because he acted all powerful at his first coming, but because he submitted himself to the death of the cross. And because he died, he was slain. And by his blood, then, he was able to buy people back for God. And not just from 
the 12 tribes of Israel, but from every tribe and language and people and nation from the whole earth. Jesus' death at his first coming sets the example of how future believers who will be living during the end times, particularly after we're gone in that first rapture, how they're going to win the war. Okay, How are they going to overcome? How are they going to um, get victory? It's by their death. Okay, These are people who are going to be martyred. And for the people who are still alive and survive and remain during the reign of the beast, they will get the victory by not taking the mark, not worshiping the beast, not worship, worshiping the image of the beast, and so on. It's always at cost. It will always cost. The victory costs something, and it, the victory is achieved through bloodshed, through death through self-sacrifice. So this theme of being faithful and loyal no matter what the cost is a theme that's going to actually be carried out through the rest of the chapters in Revelation. Now we get to verse 10 of Revelation 5, and this one's a little controversial because depending on which version of the Bible you read uh, will be what it says. So in some versions it will say, And you have made us a kingdom and priests to our God, and we shall reign on earth. And some versions say, And you have made them, that is the people that are being prayed for, a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. Well, the fact is, both of those things are true. The elders who are praying are going to rule and reign on earth, and the people on earth for whom they are praying uh, it also includes the 144,000 of Israel who are going to reign on the earth. Okay, The martyrs of the harlot, however, will not reign on earth, and we're going to talk about them and what the deal is with them on another video. And the martyrs of the beast, that is, those who are beheaded by the beast, they're going to rule and reign on the earth. So it doesn't matter really what your translation is, whether it's uh, us, them, or we, they. Um, both are true. So that's pretty cool. So the elders are people who are going to be made kings and priests. The 144,000 of Israel are going to reign as kings with Christ on earth if they're faithful and they overcome. And so will the martyrs of the beast. Now, in verse 11, we see angels joining in with the worship of the Lamb. Okay, where before the living creatures and so on were worshiping God, now they're going to worship the Lamb. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Okay, this is one of my favorite passages that um, is in Handel's Messiah. It's just awesome. I just think it's glorious. I, I do hope we get to sing that once we're in heaven, even if it is subpar to what the angels are singing. Okay, finally, we see all creation worshiping the Lamb. And I'm going to share with you an aha moment that I had when I was reading this these next two verses. And I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, in the sea, and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. So the question now is, when will all these creatures worship God? Okay, when will everybody, bad guys and good guys, worship God? When will the bad angels and the good angels worship God? Well, it's not right here in Revelation 5 in this particular scene. So this is where we're actually being thrust into the future to a later time. But when? Okay, where, where is this? Is this uh, with the creation of the new heavens and the new earth? Is this at the end when Christ returns? When is everybody going to worship Christ? It's not here. Not, I mean, there's still bad guys on the earth and earth dwellers and um, uh, say, fallen ones who are refusing to worship Christ. Eventually, even people who were refusing to worship Christ during the um, during the time of tribulation and trial, 
they're going to have to worship Christ. So when does this happen? Well, because the sea is still in existence and we know that after the great white throne judgment, the sea will not be in existence anymore. So this has to be in, in a time that takes place um, before the great white throne judgment. And it won't be during the millennium, but it probably will be at the second coming of Christ, okay, like around the seventh trumpet. And I think there's an Old Testament passage that talks about this, Isaiah 45, 22 through 25. Turn to me and be saved, all, in, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength. To him shall come and be ashamed, all who were incensed against him. So this seems to me to be taking place after the second coming of Christ. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God. Okay, I want to do a little summary here. Uh, a passage from the book of Philippians that talks about how victory is achieved. And this passage perfectly expresses the attributes of Christ. The, the attributes that enabled him to be able to accept this commission from, from God and to achieve the victory. It's, it starts with humility and self-sacrifice. And these same attributes are going to be what will enable Christ's followers who will be living on earth during the end times, the ability to rule and to reign with him. Yeah. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Get a copy of the show notes. Let me know what you think in the comments section. We'll see you on another video. Till then, have a blessed day. Mm -hmm.